Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Benissimo. Coming up on Dream of Italy. Hasta power. <laughs> we go to Umbria. Rocco is the boss. And discover what makes this region the hidden gem of Italy. I'm Kathy McKay. In this series, we'll meet the authentic characters, uncover the hidden treasures, and discover what makes Italy the most fascinating country in the world. Join me as we dream of Italy. Italy's only region with neither a coastline nor a border with a foreign country. More rustic and less visited than its neighbor Tuscany, Umbria has a distinct feeling, a wildness that is hard to find in the famous region to the west. It's a land of massive hills, steep valleys, and picturesque but little known villages and towns. If people know anything about Umbria, it is usually only its most famous inhabitant, St. Francis of Assisi. Born in the 12th century, he was the son of a rich merchant, a spendthrift and bon vivant who had a sudden spiritual awakening and spent the rest of his life helping the poor and founding several monastic orders. He is also known as the patron saint of animals. His hometown of Assisi is one of the loveliest in Italy, with a stunning position high on the slopes of Mount Subasio. It is also beautifully preserved, with 2,000 years of Roman, medieval, and Renaissance architecture on display. Further up the mountain, the Eremo delle Crociere is an ancient retreat for mystics that St. Francis visited frequently during his life. It is hard not to imagine him here. So little has changed in 800 years. The air seems suffused with a peacefulness, and the villages have a timeless quality, as if he had only just passed through. Across the valley from Assisi, the city of Perugia has a history that goes back even further. Although it was founded by the native Umbri tribe, by the 5th century BC, it had become one of the primary towns of the powerful Etruscan League. Today, it is a bustling and beautiful city. The University of Perugia is one of Italy's largest and student life fills the town with a youthful energy. But history is everywhere. Down a quiet side street, a small workshop in a 500-year-old palazzo keeps the rich tradition of stained glass production very much alive. Maralena Forlezza is the fourth generation of her family to run the studio that was founded by Francesco Moretti in the 19th century. Moretti was an innovator in an art that goes back a thousand years. His stunningly realistic depictions of people took stained glass out of its medieval past and into the modern world. Because he wanted to demonstrate that the vetro was not an art minor and that si potevano fare con il vetro re, vetrate belle quanto i quadri e quindi io ho creato un legame con un uomo, Francesco Moretti, che non ho conosciuto. Stained glass production is extremely time consuming and labor intensive. Allora, per realizzare una vetrata bisogna innanzitutto eh, fare il eh, bozzetto, poi il disegno a grandezza reale. Dopodiché viene deciso come far passare i piombi intorno al, al vetro e quindi il disegno viene eh, diviso eh, in varie parti. 
queste, queste separazioni vengono eh, passate su un cartoncino e eh, il cartoncino a sua volta viene tagliato e così avremo noi i vetri che servono per contornare provvisoriamente il vetro e attaccarlo contro un, tela, un, un supporto sempre di vetro e quindi dalla, questa cosa dà la possibilità di vedere la vetrata contro luce naturale perché mettere in cera ti fa vedere la vetrata in un'altra maniera, ti fa vedere l'insieme, ti fa apprezzare eh, ogni, ogni singolo eh, punto. Maddalena grew up in the palazzo above the workshop, and her childhood was spent watching the artisans who toiled here. She is driven by a passion to preserve their legacy. Una scelta di vita che a volte mi chiedo se è stata giusta. Poi quando vengono i visitatori o le persone che apprezzano questo luogo dico sì, beh, non potevo fare altro e sono soddisfatta perché mi dà tanta, so, tanta passione, mi dà comunque mi dà tante emozioni. Madalena's devotion to her art is inspiring. Perhaps there is something in the air in Perugia. When you start to look, you see the city is full of artists and artisans. In a quiet piazza on the edge of town, inside a 13th century church, Marta Cuccia also works with the tools that her family passed down to her. As she explains, weaving is a deep tradition among the peasant women of the Umbrian countryside. Quindi veniva piantato il lino, veniva poi filato ed inverno, quando non si lavorava nei campi, producevano tessuti per la casa. Mia bisnonna si innamorò di quest'arte e inizialmente comprava dalle contadine per poi rivendere a Perugia. Marta's great-grandmother soon started buying old looms and founded a weaving school to help local women to earn money for their work. E poi per quattro generazioni di donne continuiamo ancora a utilizzare gli stessi telai che recuperò la mia bisnonna e molti dei decori che lei ritrovò. The workshop closed in 1993, but Marta couldn't bear to see the looms in disuse, so she learned how to use them. Mi è piaciuto talmente tanto lavorare al telaio che completamente in maniera sprovveduta, ho riaperto l'attività nel 1995. Marta has become both an expert weaver and an historian of the craft. In questo laboratorio realizziamo ancora magnifiche stoffe realizzate con telai manuali del 1800 e 1700. La tradizione è molto antica. Nel Medioevo Perugia era famosissima per la produzione di questi tessuti. Il telaio che sto utilizzando adesso è un telaio a jacquard. La macchina a jacquard fu il primo computer al mondo. Abbiamo appunto la macchina che è sopra il telaio che legge queste schede forate. The cards tell the loom how to create the pattern. In a way, the weaver is merely the engine for the loom. Lanciamo la spola con questo sistema di corde che si chiama spola volante e fu brevettato nel 1750. These looms were the first salvos in the Industrial Revolution. Their invention began the long, slow process of replacing workers with machines. Precedentemente a questo marchingegno, questo sistema di leve, si lavorava in due persone. Una persona, un tessitore da un lato, uno dall'altro a lanciarsi la navetta. Questa è la cosa per me più affascinante e quella che mi lega tantissimo a questo lavoro. Il fatto ogni volta di poter creare un oggetto diverso che sarà un pezzo unico per quella persona e non verrà più rifatto. Quindi per me è veramente come una droga. Mi piace tantissimo. In Perugia's main square, I treat myself to a fantastic espresso at the historic Sandri pasticceria and bar. It's a perfect spot to get that little boost I'll need before I head out of town for a very special experience. Mm -hmm. 
Just outside of Perugia's towering city walls, the world-famous Perugina Chocolate Factory has been making bocce since 1904. Perugina. Bocce means kisses in Italian, and these perfect little chocolate bites have passed through millions of lips since they were first invented right here. As good as they are straight from the factory, I decide to try my hand making them from scratch. Master chocolatier Massimiliano Guido Baldi has agreed to show me how it's done. So nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank you for having me here at the Perugina Chocolate School. Yes. I'm going to learn more about chocolate than I ever wanted to know. The first step is to make the ganache, a sublime mix of chocolate and cream. We use hazelnut chocolate. And we can smell it. Milk cream inside here. So we're waiting for it to boil. And we go inside with the chocolate. Okay, it and melts. melts very, very fast. And the ganache okay. is ready. Chopped hazelnuts are added. Chin chin. Chin chin. <laughs> the ganache is put into a pastry bag. It's perfect. I cut the sucker posh and make a big, I, I cut a big part. And with my hand, The bacio, the bacio is a chocolate without the mold. Then the balls are rounded by hand. One, two, three. Okay. And an individual hazelnut is placed on top. With a very good hazelnut. The final step is to dip them in tempered dark chocolate. The tempering is a thermic shock from hot chocolate to cold. I go with two thirds of chocolate on the table and one little part remain inside. Massimiliano shows me how it's done. Open, change, and turn in the center. It's not as easy as it looks. Am I doing this right? What? No, uh, change. All right. It's simple, but difficult. And make this. Oh, yes. Then the cooled ganache balls are dipped in the tempered dark chocolate, and you have bocce. On the paper. Beautiful, very, very nice. As thrilling as it is to learn how to make the world famous bocce, I'm ready to get out into the Umbrian countryside. Less than an hour south of Perugia, near the town of Bivania, I find the perfect place. At this small farm, Diego Calcabrina and his assistant Alina make goat cheese. We have uh, three, four uh, different types of cheese. The first one is a fresh cheese. Uh, the second one is uh, the same cheese, but with a, a very uh, white skin. <laughs> the last one, the name is a uh, cachotta and uh, is uh, a little spicy. I chose to produce uh, goat cheese because I like it. Diego's passion for goat cheese is unusual in Umbria, a region known more for sheep and cow's milk cheeses. Without a local tradition to draw on, Diego had to go to school to learn the craft. Uh, really, I'm not a farmer. Uh, I just study <laughs> like a farmer. Diego takes me on a tour of the barn. Do you make cheese every day? Every day in the, in the summer, in the spring, and the, every couple day in the, in the autumn. Diego's love for the animals and the care he puts into the cheeses has made the farm a success. What's his name? <coughs> Rocco. Hi, Rocco. Rocco. <laughs> Rocco is the boss, is yes, the boss. <laughs> he's supervising. Yeah, everything. that's supervised around 150 goats. The work is hard. The goats need to be milked every day from February to November. In the late fall, they are bred, and they spend the winter gestating. In the spring, the baby goats, called kids, are born. Throughout the year, the goats spend a lot of time outdoors, eating through the rich grasses and wild greens that grow in the Umbrian fields. Diego and Alina do have a little help with the goats, a border collie named JJ. I asked him if it was hard to train JJ to work with him and the goats. It's not difficult. You, you have a good feel with animals in general. 
It's no aggressive way to move the goat. The goats eat the grass and make the milk to make the cheese. What could be more beautiful and simple? Umbrian riches from the land. We work hard. <laughs> if you want to come here, <laughs> I'm uh, with my hand open and uh, so. The gentle hills surrounding Diego's goat farm are filled with vineyards whose leaves paint the countryside red, orange, and gold in the fall. The tiny, once little-known towns of Bavania and Montefalco now attract international visitors in search of the perfect vintage of Merlot, Sangiovese, and most importantly, local superstar grape Sagrantino. This indigenous grape has experienced a renaissance over the last 20 years and drawn winemakers such as the Lunelli family from Northeast Italy. Not content to build just a winery, they have constructed a striking modern structure called the Carapace. In Italy, whenever we do things, we try to do it not only good, not only nice, but we try to do it in a beautiful way. And that's why the Carapace was born. The Carapace is the shell of a turtle. The turtle is a symbol of luck, stability, and longevity. The designer of the Carapace, sculptor Arnaldo Pomodoro, was inspired by the landscape to create this unusual shape. That was really the beginning and was the easy part. The difficult part was translating into something which is huge and massive like this. As striking and modern as the Carapace is, it does feel as if it's an organic part of this land. And that is no easy feat. Cheers. Cheers. Salute. Over the hill in Montefalco, Sagrantino lovers seek out another man, Marco Caprai, who is a towering figure in the grape's evolution. I'm considered the father of the modern Sagrantino. When Marco began working with his father at the Arnaldo Caprai winery in 1987, Sagrantino grew on just a few hundred acres in Montefalco and was unknown outside the area. He worked tirelessly to refine its cultivation. Sagrantino is one of the most interesting uh, Italian indigenous grape and oh, today is uh, also one of the most uh, studied grapes of Italy. Considered one of the most tannic and powerful of all grapes, Sagrantino now grows on thousands of acres here in Montefalco and vintners across the world have planted this once obscure variety. In Umbria, where there's great wine, incredible food is not far away. And Arnaldo Capri's resident chef, Salvatore Denaro, is going to show me how to make it. Welcome, benvenuta. Thank you for having me here in your kitchen in Umbria. And so we're going to make some Umbrian specialties, right? Si, una this is a special recipe, this traditional recipe in, uh, in Umbria. This maltagliati con i ceci, chickpeas, soup, with maltagliati, it's pasta. We start with a variety of small chickpeas or ceci that are local to the area. We heat the chickpeas in water with garlic and rosemary for a little over an hour. But the true fun of the dish, in more ways than one, is making the pasta that will go in the soup. The secret is to use two flours, a mixture of semolina and durum. Like any good chef, Salvatore estimates by sight. I think uh, 8, 10 eggs. 8, okay, 10 okay. eggs. Okay. Benissimo. Vai, Cathy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Benissimo. As we start, Salvatore serenades me with a song. Ah, certo, mamma, solo per te la mia canzone vola. Mamma. Mm. If you sing to the pasta. La pasta è più buona, it's, it's è più better. buona. This go. Absolutely. Look. It's hard work to make pasta. Bellissimo. Bene, bene, bene. Mm. Anche una lotta. Salvatore shapes it into a ball. This is the rest, rest for half hour. Half hour? Half hour. Half hour. Okay. okay. While we wait for the dough to rise, we make the rest of the soup. Extra virgin oil, tomato, and marjolaine. Perfect. The dough has risen, and we are ready to roll out the pasta. Pasta power! power. <laughs> We're ready to okay. go. 
Prego, grazie. Prova anche te. Slow, slow. Perfect. Slow food. Not fast here, Andrea. He shows me how to cut the pasta, the mal tagliati, which literally means badly cut. Non sono mal tagliati, sono ben tagliati. It can't be all work when you're cooking. Sembrano tante farfalle, it's butterfly. Farfalline, guarda che bella. Ah, bellissimo. Mm. After a quick dip in boiling water, the pasta is ready to add to the soup. Uno per me e uno per te. Poco poco. Extra virgin oil. A simple yet flavorful dish representative of the cucina povera, or poor man's cuisine here in Umbria. Buon appetito. Buon appetito. Mm. Delicious. My journey through Umbria has been incredible, eye-opening and mouth-watering. For my last stop, I make my way to the remote Nera Valley, deep in the hills east of Spoleto. Here, the steep stone walls of Castel San Felice rise up from the valley floor. And just outside the village, Marta Giampiccolo runs a small saffron farm on her family's land. Saffron is derived from the flowers of the saffron crocus, and at up to $13,000 per pound, it is the most expensive food in the world. Marta and other local farmers have only recently revived its production. scoperto circa una ventina, no, una quindicina di anni fa che si coltivava in questa zona fino al 1550 circa. Ogni anno si piantano i bulbi ad agosto. Poi da metà ottobre a metà novembre per un mese fiorisce. But each flower only lasts for a single day. Si raccolgono tutte le mattine, si va al campo e si raccolgono i fiori quando sono chiusi chiusi in bocciolo. The saffron spice is actually the stigma of the flower. Three red threads per flower, nothing more. Saffron is Marta's business, but she and the village elders have also rekindled the ancient practice of harvesting the wild greens that grow in the fields and meadows. This knowledge was almost lost after the Second World War, when it was viewed as a relic of the region's poverty-stricken past. Ah, questi qui sono caccialebri e li utilizziamo per fare le insalate di verdura cruda. Allora, si utilizzano molto in questo periodo perché vabbè, è una delle tante erbe che crescono spontanee. Cigoria, questa selessa poi si fa soffritta. What was once essential for survival is now a foundation of healthy living. E so e fanno molto bene perché sono depurativi, perché la saprosella, eh, noi la chiamiamo così, adesso è, è molto fresca Baskets in hand, the group walks back to the village to sort their bounty. Costing nothing more than their time and the effort to pick them, these plants will nourish the bodies and souls of the women and their families. Umbria has a soulfulness and depth that can take you by surprise. The warmth of the people is intoxicating, and its beauty is simply astounding. I can't wait to come back and drive deep into the hills and get lost. Who knows what I'll find next time?